Your Cannabis Project community. It's that rotten son of a blunt, Lobster Fam Farms, back for episode 11 of Cannabinoid Education with helpful Harry Rose. Um, I think today we're going to be, or Harry's going to be touching on some hash related stuff, perhaps cultivars that might be good to select for hash right now, this time of year, if you're planning on planting, maybe different curing techniques, different extraction techniques, and then kind of whatever Harry deems valuable and worth talking about. Um, I'd like to take, <laughs> I'd, like to take, I'd like to take this quick moment to give a big public thank you to Harry. I don't think like most do-gooders, you realize how much of a positive impact you've had on Future Cannabis Project by taking your time and sharing your knowledge. And I'd just like to give you a big thank you from me specifically, at least, because I know how much wisdom and like, you know, knowledge and how to implement these these practices from you i'd just like to say thank you from me and the community i'd also like to say real quick because we forgot the last episode i was half asleep um you can support helpful harry at humble legacy seeds at gmail.com and there's tons of hitters in there me cannabis hills a couple other people have found some serious serious heat in there so you can hit up humble legacy seeds at gmail.com I was trying to coerce Harry into doing some sweetheart deal for this next spring week. We'll see if uh, he thinks of something throughout the show and if he, he offers. But uh, I see Corey in the chat there, too. Much love to my homie, Corey. Today was a great day. Good, good vibes. And with that, Admiral, you're the man. Hey, hey, hey. Let me see if I can uh, look this up here. If I can actually see y'all. But, um, yeah, I was just going to touch on a few things today, I guess, having to do with uh, things. Well, I think we were going to talk about the, um, the hemp situation first and foremost, right? We can kick it on the, the farm bill, yeah. And um, – <clears throat> I think it's worth talking about just briefly because, um, you know, essentially there's a lot, there's a lot going on because of the farm bill that I don't think everybody in our community knows about. And, um, I think it's important that people do so that they can at least weigh in, um, <clears throat> you know, depending on it, it always pays to vote either way. Right. So, the farm bill that passed a couple of years back, essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, now we're seeing the effects of it, essentially legalized cannabis. And how did it do that? It did that by making it so that, um, you know, THCA that is derived from quote unquote hemp that when it's sold has less than 0.3 percent delta 9 thc specifically when it's sold when it's received so it could have a hundred you know it could have uh let's say 90 percent thca as long as it has less than 0.3 percent delta 9 thc it's federally legal under the 2018 farm bill essentially and what that means is, you know, it means that cannabis is legal and it just took this long for people to realize it. Um, they're talking about a number of different things. There was an addendum that was out there uh, that's supposed to make all forms of tetrahydrocannabinol, you know, whether it's acidic or not, whether it's you know, Delta 8, 9, 10, 11, doesn't matter. Whatever form of THC it is, it's it's basically illegal and or regulated. <clears throat> so that was on the table, but it still hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and so, you know, right now that is the law of the land and everybody thinks about hemp with CBD, but essentially because of the way this law reads and because they didn't specifically call out THCA um, or other cannabinoids, <coughs> they're legal essentially too. 
all the laws and regulations specifically call Delta 9 THC out in terms of percentages and and so on. So there's a huge market, which I'm sure a lot of people know about, but I just wanted to discuss it briefly so that people know what they're seeing and realize the impact that it's having on the regulated market where people are under state regulations currently, like in the state of California, like myself and other people that have cultivation licenses, manufacturing licenses. Now, that's very, very intensely, you know, regulated with a lot of compliance, but it has nothing to do with the farm bill. We can actually sell products that are, that's more than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. That's the one big advantage to it. But other than that, um, you know, essentially we're going through all of this compliance when the hemp people essentially don't have any regulations other than normal, you know, basic uh, business practice type of regulations. So there's a lot of states right now that are looking at this. I think there's like a couple dozen states that have sent letters to the federal attorney general to talk to them and the DEA about the fact that this is going on. And, <laughs> you know, according to the DEA, they know this already. And so it's going to, it's definitely going to come to a head at some point. And it's, it remains to be seen whether it's going to happen during, you know, the election cycle or not. Um, what a lot of people are calling for, you know, even on the Fed, federal side is for deregulation they were they were talking about descheduling i mean uh, uh descheduling is what we're talking about what they were talking about is rescheduling to schedule three and now those same people are now talking about descheduling completely which obviously would be the best thing for us but in a lot of senses it would blow up all the current markets and then it would become something else, which is fine, you know, because free the herb, of course, first and foremost, but everything that we've already built up and are used to in our normal business practice will get blown up basically uh, once they deschedule it, because then it'll be like anything else. It'll be like anything else. So, so what do you think about this uh, lobster? Uh, so many nuances. Um... I think first and foremost, people who use that bill, whether it be to grow, you know, type two hemp, CBD, whatever the politically correct term is, or people that are just abusing it to sell, you know, type one, you know, THC high flower. I don't think most people doing that are craft level or like small scale. I think anyone trying to go that route is already trying to go the commodity route, economy of scale not trying to create many branded craft products. So it tells me that it's a dirty game. It's definitely not fair to us as like smaller businesses, smaller farms going through more hoops. But I also see them already pigeonholing themselves into the commodity market, which I don't want anything to do with. I want to be a, I want to sell a branded product that actually has value. I don't want to sell. There's a lot of crap out there. There is a lot of craft hemp out there. It's just you got to pay attention to it. But I, I certainly can think Whoa. of a bunch of people doing craft hemp and just and most so on. It's that. just the fact that there's THCA blowing up everywhere and becoming, you know, the, the harsh reality of it is, though, what it does is it creates, you know, the, the instant ability to be national. So, for small brands, like I've seen small brands already that were struggling and going out of business in California because of how hard it is and how expensive it is in California, they shut down and opened under the hemp laws, basically in the same place with no regulations. They're instantly able to sell to like 42 states because a few states have outlawed um, intoxicating hemp products. Um, but most haven't. And so they're able to market to the whole state. 
I mean, the whole country. And because of that, they're also able to uh, use regular financial services like Square. Yeah. Where and and the other thing is, um, they're able to advertise on places like Instagram without getting shut down, um, and do ad campaigns. And we can't. You know, it's incredible. So it's. The, the, the reality is that is the legal route right now. And so that's, you know, in terms of overgrowing the government, right? This is what you got to realize, regardless, it, you know, yes, there's some big players in this market, but what you got to realize is this is the door that's open. Like, I have no idea why anybody would even be in the quote unquote traditional market intentionally bypassing any legal route whatsoever, because you can always figure out a way to be selling hemp in almost any state, except for the six that's, that it's been outlawed, you know, um, or something, six or eight that it's been outlawed essentially. So it gives people a legal opportunity to sell any product, including live rosin or a lot of different things fall under, un, you know, under that same classification of being less than 0.3% Delta nine THC by weight. Now, let me ask you this, Admiral. I have a couple of thoughts still circling now. Do you, uh, think, do you think that the chickens are going to come home to roost eventually? And do you think all of these big companies that are most likely paying state and federal tax and trying to do everything right they can, do you think that the alphabet boys are going to come back at whatever point? Because it seems like so much of a free for all right now that my bro science tells me it's an observation phase. And then when it's I time for them to when it's time for them to get busy, I think things are going to happen. Like, I don't know exactly what no, I, I, part of that would be. Would you entertain this option as a, as a small, oh, if, if I was a small, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I already have entertained it. The reality is um, it is legal and legit. So you, if you start a business and you file taxes and you grow under the guise of growing hemp THCA or CBD and sell your products like anybody else selling anything else except for cannabis that they would consider a drug which is wild right you do the same thing in the same state the same kind of plants just in a different system and you know the state regulators are aware of this they're just ignoring this and because you know people like myself that have to be very strictly you know we're we're strictly monitored we're on track and trees we're you know we get inspected um by every agency every year and you know doesn't happen with the farm bill grows it's not like they have to metric fields no right? it's it's, yeah. it's absolutely zero i mean there is a chance of getting spot checked to make sure that you're actually less than 0.3 percent at point of sale right but there's not really any consequence besides having chopped down the crop, right? And I, and I just want to say for the record here, you know, this is happening all over the country. You know, there's states like Texas, which historically has been, which has been very, very strict with cannabis laws, regardless of the fact that a lot of people are consumers there. Um, they have had very, very strict cannabis laws, but, from what I've seen and heard and, and know from people that I, I work with that have just been there, there are these hemp THCA shops and um, no. like ice cream truck delivery places and kiosks Get the all, fuck over out the of here. all over the place. Get the fuck out of here. Yes. And you so think, you, think they're, you think they're growing it there or just shipping it in, like just shipping away. All of the above. Farm? It's, it's all of the above. There are definitely large scale hemp grows <laughs> in wow. Texas and all over the country now, like Wisconsin, which has not been able to put medical cannabis laws through now has a bunch of pretty epic hemp farms, quote unquote. And it, you know, we'll see what happens with that. If they, tighten the belt on that and make it so it has to be just t cbd but i do know that there's people doing the hemp thca and in, in in all kinds of places and 
it is staggering. It is amazing. It is wild, but it's totally true. And so that's why I just encourage everybody, you know, if you want to overgrow the government, that is the way like, and you don't, there's no point in being in the traditional market. If that is available to you as a legal option, because, you know, it opens up all doors for advertising and streamlining everything. And, um, you, you know, be, like, and, and willing to pay taxes, I think, because most people, there's not no most reason people not to, because you can, there's a percentage of people I would say that do it in the traditional, whatever the quotations is because simply because of that tax free, anything is good. You know, like, yeah, I, I agree. And you know, I have look, no qualms. Everybody's entitled to their own, you know, and I respect that. I do believe me. That's, you know, and I understand why too. Um, you know, I've, I've had to make sacrifices in my life basically to help patients and to get the education out there. But, you know, I, I respect anybody doing what they need to do, of course. However, however, um, you know, if you can have a legitimate business uh, with all the normal write-offs and, and so on and act like a normal business, then you actually can make some decent you know, profit. And that's the truth of it, like a respectable business. But it's when all the regulations get strapped onto it that it becomes uh unattainable to 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 manage it's it's really difficult in the current regulated markets because of how intense the regulations are the regulations are very intense because state local authorities it first of all it trickles down from the feds to the state responsibility then from the state to the local responsibility which is why still in the state of California, over 60% of the municipalities do not allow cannabis businesses there um, because they don't, the state doesn't fund or help them with any of the responsibilities in, in terms of, you know, what codes to enforce and, and even how to, you know, all the resources that are needed. It was a really big undertaking, I know, for Humboldt County. I was, you know, in the first handful of people, I was the first type six license. Um, and it was, it was very challenging for me and them because nobody had ever done this. Nobody knew what codes or anything were relevant for this industry and for that type of license and so on. So Anyway, it's it, it it's overall a big challenge, and it remains to be seen whether it's going to be worth it to have a license in a regulated market, or whether you know it really is going to just keep opening up more and more and more under this uh, twenty eighteen farm bill is where it all started. You know, they could, you know, any president, any Congress, Senate, whatever, they could just turn around and slam the farm bill and 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 change it so that it's it's not that way anymore they could add that addendum in that i was telling you about that basically makes all forms of thc uh regulated and federally scheduled you know so it really it remains to be seen you know um I can tell you that there's definitely directions that we could potentially be heading in here in the near future that, you know, it's just hard to know. It's really hard to know. But I think that in general, it looks like currently because of the hemp bill, you know, the cannabis virtually is legal. And uh, I definitely uh, challenge people to see what they can do with that. <coughs> I love that. that. Yeah, that's that's some very enlightening uh, direction that you took with that. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's a surprising direction, but I hope folks are listening. And if you have ambitions and kind of there's been some restrictions, do your research and like there may be opportunity. Yeah, yeah you got to do your research and you got to set things up properly. But it's it's not, you know, this is it's not rocket science you know you have to start a basic business and then essentially you know these people people have websites and advertising and you know marketability uh financial services banking you know banking is huge because currently the 
regular cannabis market does not have banking. It's really bizarre, you know, because when I, I talk to regulators, I talk to, um, you know, inspectors, I've just got inspected uh, for one of our, we just got inspected for both our manufacturing licenses. And, you know, when you ask them, you know, they're just like, you ask them about it and they're like, well, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't, I don't understand it either. <laughs> um, you know, they're like, I, you know, like, cause there's people that, that are getting inspected that are shutting down, surrendering their licenses and then opening back up as hemp businesses. And there's really nothing that they can do at that point. Right. It's, it's very bizarre. Man, I hope that's helping a bunch of uh, veteran growers in places where the the options might be few and far in between. I'm hoping a lot of people are saving their their farms and sustaining their family with that option. That's that's a whole different direction you took with that the start of the farm bill. That's pretty. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put tons of money into it yet because it's very volatile. But in terms of just operating, it doesn't take much to start a business and to be able to operate legitimately versus like people that are operating on certain platforms that the federal agents are all over nailing people right and left now. I mean, I just don't even understand why anybody would do that when this currently is an option. Absolutely. And I doubt the farm bill is going to get sorted out in this respect this summer. You know, there's been an addendum that's been sitting there for eight months already. The nuance um, of an election year as well. It's like, I don't think I, they want to I, just, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's, I, I think they may just kick the can down the road is what I think. I don't think, because right now this is a multi-billion dollar business. I just don't think they're going to disrupt it right before the election unless it's to turn around and say, guess what? It's federally legal now, you know, somehow. Like, unless they do that, like, I just don't see them met rock in the boat. <laughs> it would be suicide for yeah. any political candidate to rock the cannabis boat right now. I love Even that we said election year and the OG Northern Light Don pops in. Big respect, homie. Keep it cool. <clears throat> well, that's what I'm saying. You know, like I think they'll kick the I think they'll kick the cannabis can down the road. I don't think that uh I know they have to do certain things with the farm bill. I just don't think they're gonna change much when it comes to cannabis right now <clears throat> you know i think they'll you know unless they make it better so that cannabis is even more legal and then they make it better for farmers so that it looks better for a political party you know like i just don't see them messing with it right now you know when it comes to the cannabis stuff which means it's going to go on for another year, basically. And if it keeps going on the way it is, it's already been a few years that this has been building up. Um, there's so many businesses that are huge based on this right now that it's hard to believe they're going to do anything to change it. A 1% limit would be interesting. I feel like that opens up so much more genetic potential, even if you're dealing with it by the numbers, like combustible THC or whatever that metric is, you know, like I, I feel like if, if they do 1%, then it'll make it real easy. And in terms of tighter controls, hopefully they do. And they make it so that people have to at least test, but <clears throat> you know, we'll see what that really even means. If it's still less than 1%, it's going to be real easy to do what I'm saying, you know, and I don't see, um, all right, I hope you're right, but I'll see it. We'll see it when we, we'll see it when I believe it as my mom used to say. <laughs> I do uh, think it's a very, un, very unpredictable ship to try to forecast for all of us. We can all do our best. And even with, I agree. I, I just, data, every, and even with inside information, I think it's still just speculation. It's like, this is fucking of course. crazy shit. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's just this, you know, the addendum has been sitting there for like eight months or more now, you know, so I, and they could have signed that in, but they didn't. 
So that's why I'm kind of like, they may just leave it the way it is. They may, they may make it even more insane, you know, <laughs> raise the limits and make it even more open, you know. I guess the good doctor just called and fixed it for us, actually. I think we're all set for 2024. Good man. <laughs> right. I <laughs> well, even with inside the point, is, the point is to exploit it. It's wide open right now, folks. Cannabis is virtually legal right now because of that. And so, I mean, people don't realize the government doesn't even realize for the most part that THCA is the it's you know, the precursor to Delta 9 THC. It's wild. It's wild. When you talk to the regulators about it, it's truly wild and breathtaking how rules and laws get made, but yet the people that have to make them and apply them don't understand them. And so because of that, the craziest things happen. <laughs> but I certainly think it's a much safer option than fucking trapping on Telegram and <laughs> where like you know, we're literally, you know, the feds are just sitting there nailing people one by one. It's like, that just doesn't, it's well, like, this what, is what I heard recently is that Telegram doesn't even pretend to be encrypted. I, that made me understand even less of what's going on nowadays. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't care, but it just, like I said, when something's wide open like this, if it gets exploited and the government's get, get, you know, if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and everybody does it, believe me, there's not much they can do. It's going to be really hard for them to shut it down in any way as it is because of how out of control it already is. When you really tune in to how many businesses there are under this law set the way it is, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, and there's a lot of big businesses. There's a lot of big businesses that are, that have already created, you know, secondary businesses like, you know, like I'm not going to name them here, but there's some major players in California that, ha that are already nationwide in terms of cannabis, but they are, <clears throat> You know, they are now selling to six or 12 states, basically, through the, the farm bill. Their products that are the same thing, essentially, as what they're making for the California regulated market, but they're selling it in, in these various states now. And they've set up a completely secondary assembly line and in a different building, you know, that's not under license and all that. And it's just happening more and more and more. So that's why. What the hell? I'd say just do it. Get while well, the getting's good. <laughs> Make hay while the sun shines, happy farmers. Make hay. That's what I'm saying, man. There's a lot of farmers that are truly suffering. So to make money under the farm bill, why not? And, and like I was saying, there are some craft actual CBD. You know, it's it's CBD drug plant, but it, it meets the, the hemp uh qualifications and um i'd say if you're into it grow some medicine you know grow some good high quality cbda flower and uh meet that demand too that's out there there's not much high quality there's plenty of hemp out there there's not much craft high quality stuff out there I agree. I think there's a huge demand more than anyone would speculate. I think more than the most ambitious speculation people don't realize. They underestimate women's consumption. They underestimate general consumers' consumption who might actually like cannabis if it wasn't all, you know, lemon cherry gelato and whatever, you know, bullshit I'm growing, whatever we're all growing. It's like, I don't know. I think so underestimated and undervalued. Oh yeah, of course. If they're if they were checking people, you're right. The USDA matters, but it doesn't matter right now because nobody's checking nothing. That's why Cookies is selling pounds, you know, and shipping them to people's door of you know twenty six, twenty eight, thirty percent THC eight flower. Um, and people are going to continue to push it. That's the reality. I mean, 
you know, it used to be that you had to buy certified seeds that were known to not produce drug plant. Yeah. You know, that, that used to be how hemp was. It was like or hay. Those were the options. You could order hay for the trades. You know, mm -hmm. I believe me what, what should be, you know, what I believe the laws, I just want to be clear here. Okay. What I believe the laws should be is if, any plant that grows and creates more than 0.3% total cannabinoids, period, should be, you know, anything that's less than 0.3% total cannabinoids should be hemp. Anything more than 0.3% total cannabinoids should be considered drug plant, period. That's what that, that is what they should do. You know, forget I forget talking about one specific cannabinoid or another. Just you know, let's just make it anything less than 0.3 percent total cannabinoids, whether it's converted or not. You know, because it doesn't. You know, a a, a food and fiber plant should not be doesn't really create that much cannabinoids. I've I've seen test results of food and fiber hemp plants and it's usually like 0 0.002 percent thc i mean crazy low crazy low cannabinoids on these plants and people are mainly growing drug plant and calling it hemp and that's you know whether it's cbd a or thca that's just a fact in my in, in from what i've seen that is what i see is that most people are actually growing drug plant not food and fiber food and f there it is possible to find seeds to grow plants that are just way low in cannabinoids and that's that is hemp to me so anything more than 0.3 percent total cannabinoids in my opinion should be considered drug plant and regulated as drug plants so that everybody's on an equal playing field you know i mean of course Let's deschedule and just have it wide open so it doesn't matter and anybody can do whatever they want. But if that's not going to be the way it is, let's at least make an equal playing field between hemp, you know, what is really hemp and what is really drug plant. Yeah. I think that's a great point there. It's like the stuff that mul multiple generations ago used for cordage and, and sales and like that type of hemp product. I also love that idea, too, because if more people grew fiber hemp here, I think someone in America would have to finally set up a processing plant, which is something that like I never talk about. But I feel like that's such a crazy nuance to all this is that we don't eat. No farmer has the option to, to process it because like America just doesn't host a processing plant. So that would be a silver lining to me if like everybody could just grow their whole yard with fiber hemp eventually the market you know free market someone would have a way to process it and we could all have dope shit made out of you know really totally, totally. That'd be cool as hell yeah i've seen plenty of amazing hemp from france uh and spain that was like literally fractional amounts of cannabinoids and it was amazing for food and fiber so the fact that the truth is a lot of there is a lot of drug plant entered the hemp system because everybody's trying to exploit the CBD. And, you know, this has been going on since like the early 2000s, you know. So if you look at the test results, yes, of course, it's polluted. But I can I can show you, you know, test results plenty of test results from actual food and fiber hemp that's just fractional amounts but it's very high in nutrition very high in protein uh, omegas incredible food plants you know yeah. but it's it's all mixed now it's all polluted it's kind of like the same thing that happened with with a uh, regular drug plant frankly you know it gets polluted when people start focusing in on it and passing it around that's why it's cool to go backwards sometimes in some of the generations of genetics of anything whether it's food forget hemp or cannabis you know food is pretty awesome to go backwards in time and try to get some heirloom stuff that's from long ago and try to get it to propagate and then 
keep the seeds from that because diversity is what's key here. That's what's key. <clears throat> I love you bringing up cannabis as a food source. That's something I feel never gets brought up anymore. And it was just last night on Future Cannabis Project. Uh, Stephen Philpot, I can never say his last name right. Stephen Philpot Jr. has had some great insights. He was just talking about how nutrient rich cannabis grown for food can be, you know. And like, I, I, I think that's awesome that you bring that up as well. It's like I never bring these things up myself, but I've been waiting to see that side of hemp because it's just as powerful and maybe more powerful than it has medicine. I'd say because like. I don't know. It's at least a whole part of the equation. I love. I love this narrative. I think it's just great. That's about it. <laughs> so, how about this is a how about this is a nuance on Farm Bill product, Admiral? So they don't need to do lab testing. I'm assuming with this when they're shipping their flour all over the place. What percentage of this Farm Bill product do you think is stuff that fails legal systems in xyz state like how much from oregon is going to houston that didn't pass how much in norcal is going to houston or detroit or wherever that didn't pass or xyz city you know like well here's the thing it does have to pass being you know if it's legal it has to pass being less than 0.3 percent delta 9 thc as far as like contaminants, you know, pesticides. So in terms of all that, that, that is not currently, you know, part of anything. It's just people are trying to qualify their stuff, you it's know, at least in their minds that it's actually hemp in terms of cannabinoids. In terms of safety, you know, I all the different little tests and large tests that I've seen where people pull samples from the black market essentially um you know which feeds into this hemp thca market right now um a lot of that is tainted not all of it but a lot of it and the thing about the hemp that i keep seeing you know these sort of secret shopper um articles you know in different magazines in different states like people go and they order a bunch of different hemp products from amazon or whatever the thing that I keep seeing over and over and over again is that a lot of it doesn't meet label claims, whether it's the dosage is not anywhere near the same. Um, what it's supposed to have in it just isn't in it at all. Um, and, and sometimes in the case of a lot of these CBD products, a lot of times there's just no CBD or CBDA or anything in it at all. Um, which is kind of amazing to me. And then at the worst of it, you know, there's contaminants in it. Sometimes there's pharmaceutical contaminants. And a lot of people theorize that, you know, people will buy cheap, you know, hemp products from China and China uses hemp for remediation. So if there's like a big spill at a pharmaceutical factory and they remediate with hemp and then they make theoretically hemp oil from that and then they sell that that could be a byproduct that people see but that's fun. anyway this that's probably like the hemp that you're getting when you're buying your walmart lotion and like bullshit like that it's probably coming from china with remediated it could be, it could be. Man, that's fucking gnarly it could be it could be and but the you know the point is most of these products that get tested don't meet label claims at the very best and at the very worst they, they there's like no drug substance in there which is why you're buying it to begin with right because otherwise you might as well just buy a regular lotion or a or whatever other kind of product you're buying you know you might as well buy something else instead of something that's supposed to have a bunch of cbd in it or so that really, you know, the safety definitely worries me. And I'll, I'd be willing to bet just without, you know, getting too elaborate, I'd be willing to bet there's a fairly large percentage that would fail normal state COA tests. I would be willing to bet. Um, and I would also be willing to bet that label claims in terms of potency would, you know, um, not meet most state standards for a COA. because. You can't have a label claim on a on a state tested product in most, if not any state, that is off. So if it says it's 
25% THC, it's got to be within 10% of that at the very worst. Um, same with like milligrams of edibles, right? You can't say it's 100 milligrams and it's only 30. Uh, you have to be within 10%. So it could be 90 or 110, but it couldn't be, you know, 30 for a 100 milligram edible. So anyway. There's a lot that's missing, and believe me, there's nothing that's perfect. A lot of these state systems aren't perfect either, but it's better because a lot of products aren't tested at all. So the main thing, just like anybody, whether you're getting it traditional, whether you're getting it white market, gray market, hemp, you got to try to know who's making it so that you actually can trust the quality. It's kind of like anything, you know, you got to know who's putting it together to know the quality. Otherwise, you're really taking a chance. Anyway, not to get too crazy on it, you know, the hemp market, you know, is interesting. There's a lot of people that don't realize that essentially cannabis, because of that, cannabis kind of is legal. And because of that, when you go to states where can there is no cannabis program like Texas. I cannot believe that. There's thca shops all over the place and people are smoking it so that is just an interesting fact of life right now yeah you brought a lot to light over there it's crazy i love that you dig deep into that stuff too because it's like i hadn't realized that it had changed it that dramatically i know that it was having such a crazy impact and but like well it built up that's what's really wild like this goes back a while, you know, the 2018 farm bill is technically, but it took some legal work and, you know, people to have the legal work behind them to feel comfortable doing stuff in scale. And it's just, just like everything in this business, it's follow the leader, you know, it's like, it just takes a couple of people to do it. And then, you know, there's a ton of people just jumping in. And it has truly surprised me. Some of the people, both small and large, who have shut down their legal licensed operations to open up essentially right next door or in the same building, a uh, hemp business and essentially be selling the same thing legally. And some of these people, you know, we're barely skidding by, if at all, like going under. And now they've made millions within a few months. It's unbelievable to me. Blows my mind. And it, it, it makes me, because you got to realize, I'm, I'm not wild west. west. I mean, it's the whole, it's the whole country wild west. Like, I'm not really realizing yeah. the gravity of this. That's not I'm not doing that right now. And so, you know, I'm looking at this like, oh my God, like, there's people just cranking right now. And here I am just like skidding by, like just killing myself with all this compliance shit and everything. And these people are just cranking, you know, I think that I, I would speculate uh, not the same as you that I think the chickens are going to come home to roost. And a lot there of is no pre harvest <laughs> testing, my friend, that's what you don't understand. It's the wild West. There is no testing. Nobody's checking this. And there's basically, That's it can, awesome. plants, if you pull it at the right time and you monitor it and you keep it cool the whole time when you're drying, it will stay below the legal limit. To make it easier, they want to make it 1% Delta 9, but essentially they do not go by converted. Like in California and most regulated states, under a license system, they go by total converted cannabinoids okay but they are not going by that that's what i'm saying they the there is no enforcement of any kind of regulation where they would actually do a decarboxylated i understand what the law is supposed to be i understand how it's supposed to be interpreted i'm telling you it's not it's not even remotely there is no field testing there is no fucking testing before it, you know, none of that exists. There's just a huge wild west system of people. 
And look, there may be some legal people out there, legal beagle hemp people out there that are abiding, you know, to the, but most of the quote unquote hemp market is just wide open craziness. So um, that's, that's what, that, that's the reality. You know, I understand what theoretically is supposed to happen. That is totally not what the reality is currently. Currently, it's just off the fucking hook. It. it doesn't matter. It's like how it's interpreted, how it's enforced. It's being interpreted, and, and look. So here's the thing: you got to realize that when there's when there's a dozen people doing it, okay, they can go out there and handle this. When there are tens of thousands of people doing it, like the police in Texas, from what I've heard, again, I don't live there, but people could probably chime in, and I had friends that just went there and spent a couple of weeks there and essentially the police don't do anything there because you can't distinguish between quote unquote hemp and cannabis. And so they've just basically have a stand down, give up, you know, and, and, and yeah. And so unless there's like some big crime ring thing going on with the cannabis, it's just going to be, and there are people with giant automated greenhouses. I know people who have helped set up giant automated greenhouses that are growing, you know, all you know whatever you could think of lemon cherry gelato freaking you know uh uh royal kush sour diesel and it's all being s grown and sold under the guise of hemp thca and they harvest it they test it to make sure that it stays below 0.3 and they will harvest it and they will keep it cold and basically as long as they get a coa and and at the time that it ships it's below 0.3% they're good to go. Um, Square, from what I understand, is supporting this industry as a financial. So they want to see it. They're doing the due diligence and the risk management essentially behind it. And I believe there's others too now. You know, I just went to um, Hall of Flowers and there was a number of people talking about it. And believe me, I'm just looking into it. I am not doing this right now, but I am just watching people make money hand over fist, essentially, because the system is wide open right now. And I'm just kind of surprised that many people don't realize that the door is wide open. Um, I was always under the impression that it was more regulated than it was, but the reality is it's not. It's just completely wide open. And the fact that yes, there's, there's some lawsuits. There's the some lawsuits here and there. Texas totally changes my perception of it. I wouldn't have believed that if I didn't hear it from you. It's like, or saw it myself. But, like, I mean, there is little, there are squabbles here and there, but I, you know, as far as I see, they keep on getting extinguished because there's big players that are saying, look, this is the law of the land right now. And if you want to change it, change it. But currently it's the law of the land, you know, prove me wrong. I'll go to court. Let's do it. You know? And, so far, that is held. They have not brought anybody to court because they agree. The DEA even had a statement not too long ago that said, yeah, the HCA is legal. It's not Delta 9, you know? I mean, so if they're saying it and they're the ones that enforce, you know, it's going to take a change here to have a change. I know that's redundant, but it's true. <laughs> if I were them... And I mean, literally me, not if I was in there, like if I, if I was in their shoes, I would wait a minute, go, wait I, a minute. not like, you know, if I was actually not, if I was someone else in their shoes, if I was me in their shoes, I would go after the dirty product as a way to sort it out because that would actually do good. And you could stop people from, you know, creating that regulation. You can still leave it a wide open free for all, but with the caveat that it's got to be clean, you can't fuck around and just too much. You know, it's not that crazy where you can, you know, do whatever you want, whatever practices, dry How it out. Cigarettes want. are allowed to be crazy. I don't know. Like, that's what I would do, at least. There's no right answer, but that's what I would do. I would, I would, well, come I know, after but that people way that around and actually good. do good. SC Laboratories, one time, they've done a lot of these you know, series of tests to check shit out. Like they'll pull stuff out of the black market and test it. They'll do hemp products. One thing they did is they did a bunch of blunt wraps and they were all so polluted. It was scary. 
backwoods was just full of pesticides. It was so disgusting. It was insane. Someone uh, is gonna have homie pretty or home girl or whoever the 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 community member pretty good plants is asking if you could link or reference that DEA statement. I love how between all of us too we get a clearer picture. I mean, I didn't see a lot of this, but as usual with something this nuanced, I think there is no clear picture for anyone to be viewing yet and like i bet it changes every day like you gotta understand it, it the law is very black and white in a lot of senses you know and it really just depends on people a few different departments judgments like the dea um i don't have the link off the top of my head but you can search easily and find it that the dea at was cornered you know, essentially to make a statement about THCA. And they're like, yeah, currently under the farm bill. It was like two months ago, I think. I remember you reading that on one of your lives, I believe, like pretty much word for word, the important part. Yeah, it was all, it was all over the news that day, and I read it on my live. But unfortunately, I don't save every single thing every single time. But we can dig it out and find it if it's really necessary. But other people, uh, Google works, trust me. You just got to be patient. But yeah, it's, it's no, and that's the thing. It's no secret. Like when you're in the cannabis industry, you know, in California, like we, we just had um hall of flowers. Like it's no secret. Everybody's talking about this, you know, it's, it's pretty known and people are kind of wondering which way to go because, you know, what do you do? Do we all feel like suckers because we're sitting here in a regulated market and everybody's just doing whatever in the hemp market, you know, and it makes you feel like an idiot. Like, should I be doing all this? Like I'm killing myself to keep up compliance, you know? That's what you got to realize, folks. I am fully compliant. You know, in every way. And compliance is intense. You know, from being, having the right type of equipment where it's all certified in every, every which way. Having safety plans and quality assurance plans and cross anti, you know, cross contamination plans and emergency plans and recall plans. And of course, you have to have a, a, a product quality plan for every single SKU of every single product that you have that has thought out anything that could ever happen to go wrong and what you're going to do to prevent that. I mean, you know, manufacturing is very intense. I love it, but I don't think people realize what we actually have to go through to be compliant. So when I see, you got to understand that part, most of the reason why I know anything about the hemp market is because it pisses me off, you know, um, because of what they get away with versus what we have to do to be licensed. You know, I'm literally managing um, six licenses currently in California, three manufacturing, two distribution and a col and a cultivation license. And um, what I have to do and what I've had to do to get licensure and to stay compliant is unbelievable. And, and where I live, okay, I have to pay. I have to pay the, the, the fee of like $750 for the luxury of them to check my property for compliance by way of satellite. So they basically spy on you and charge you for that luxury. You know what I mean? So for me, you know, looking into hemp and the hemp industry is more just like R and D as to why am I doing what I'm doing and should I be doing what I'm doing? Because it's really expensive and difficult to be fully legit licensed compliant. And like I said, I see people dropping out of this industry, going into hemp and making a fortune and they're not doing anything compliant anymore like nothing so you know um, this sounds to me like what was in the original farm bill i believe not the rebuttal 
but I don't think they've been enforcing it or interpreting it that way at all. Oh, they don't. I'd be, they I'd do be not. stoked to hear if anyone, because this community is thick. I'd be stoked if anyone out there has heard of people testing hot, because this just definitely isn't no, an area of definitely it. testing hot. People are definitely testing hot. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. No question. But there are people that aren't and getting away with it. <laughs> That's the other thing. They don't do it post decarb. I'm telling you. And there is no That's spot. What I mean, are people testing hot in that aspect? Like if they're never testing that way, then it doesn't matter if it's written, if it's not enforced or interpreted that way. How can THCA I believe the one Harry was talking about was just a couple months they dropped. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was after New Year's. Why? It was pretty recent, I believe. What? The the uh, addendum? Yeah. Yeah. I want to say it was only a couple months. I don't ago. know if it was before or after. I kind of want to say it was before. Before New Year's? Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe it was then. Maybe that is apples to apples then there. Believe me, what it should be. And what it is are two different things. And as a licensed operator, it's really frustrating to have this crap going on. And this is what we're competing with. Like we're fighting within California to be able to have farmers markets and sell directly to the market. You know, small farms. It's, it's nearly impossible to get into a store. There's, there's not enough stores in California and distribution is very difficult. So then people turn around and do this stuff and they're shipping all over the country, right? I mean, it's out of control. So this seems like a solid tactic that they could come back with. I'm telling you, I speculate the chickens are going to come home to roost. So I guess if cookies is probably making a big chunk of this dough, it seems like it might be on them. Cookies is getting sued in Georgia with a bunch of other people because of not showing decarbed. Um, so it would have been their responsibility, self-regulated, to be able to present that afterwards if needed. So that no. is like some of the first. What all these people, all, Stizzy and Cookies and all these various people, what they're playing is the fact that it really is not spelled out very clearly in the enforce in in the the farm bill that they're currently enforcing and until they do you know until they say specifically that it must be the decar value in the currently enforced farm bill which is what the addendum brings to it is any form of thc it's not just decarb it's any form of THC, whether it's THCA, whether it's Delta 8, 9, 10, 11, you know, that's what it's going to bring in is any form of uh, any, any form of THC um, that you could name essentially would be a no, no, it has to be under 0.3, but currently that's not the way it is. I want to get an alphabet agent on one of these podcasts, man. We need some clarity. I need to reach out to someone because, like, being compliant, same as you said before, it's like I don't know. Like, I want to hear from the I want to hear from the horse's mouth. You know, like as much as we can all guess the best we can. Like, what the fuck? We need to get some agents on these goddamn shows. Be like, well, how do we do right? What the fuck you want from us? I can tell you that. In Eureka and Arcata, those were regulated, what they call extraction alley, manufacturers and distributors. There was a heyday. One by one, they went out of business. One by one, they turned into hemp businesses, a lot of them. <laughs> and we have regulators that are literally inspecting us and then telling me that these people are, do you know, these people are operating right hands? Like, no, I didn't actually, but they can't do anything about it. They say, and there is nothing getting done about it. So that's all I know. You know, I don't need any agent or anybody telling me this or that. Like I literally know people that have a huge, 
factory in San Francisco making edibles, shipping it to 44 states, um, super pro uh, marketing and everything. Okay. Brands like Kiva. Ever hear of Kiva? They're pretty oh, damn big. Fuck yeah, they were good back in the day. And guess what? Kiva is still the biggest distributor in California, and they are selling hemp products. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not just sitting here talking wind. <laughs> you know, I, I'm in it. I am in it to win it, and I'm surrounded by it. That's why I'm saying it kind of pisses me off. I'm, there is nothing for me to guess. I'm watching. I already know I'm watching. I'm like, you know, this isn't speculation. I'm watching this actually happen. I still I have, a factory, I I I have a factory in Eureka and I'm surrounded by people manufacturing hemp products unregulated. And I'm I'm getting inspected in there now. I want to look into their crystal ball though. I think I already have like a, a safe pathway to get there too. So all the inspectors up here that do like the compliance checks, they're all ex alphabet boys. I'm going to get someone that's retired. I'm going to ask him at least. I can't guarantee you. But the dude who inspected no. me, he was a gentleman. I mean, it got to the point where I was wanting to show him gardens and he was getting annoyed. I mean, like, you know, it was it was very, very, it was very cool. I was like, dude, check this room out. You know, this is where I'm, you know, got mothers in here. He's like, I'm going to go. You know what I mean? I only so, have 20 minutes scheduled for this. But he was a gentleman, and he said if I ever had any questions on how to keep things correct, X, Y, Z, to give him a call, I'm going to invite him to uh, to have a conversation, and then it wouldn't be any conflict of interest for him since he's retired, but at least to be able to look through the lens of that. And it'd probably just be cool to have a local regulator on here because like, that's something that never gets talked about enough. It's like people either shy away that it's some, you know, hundred thousand square foot grow like those type of people deal with it or people are just growing for personal use there's not usually an in-between Dude, it's even more insane than all this okay if you really want to get into it it's not just the hemp phca thing okay if you if you really want to get into it like i've talked to my inspectors and regulators we have to deal with inspections every year constantly from every agency involved so we just had our DCC CDPH inspection of our factory for manufacturing. And I was talking to her and it's like, there are people that are not doing the hemp thing. They have licenses and what they're doing, there are so many burner distros, they call them. So these guys buy thousands of pounds of weed and essentially waste it in metric for one reason or another. They literally just waste it. And then they ship it to New York and sell it. Um, and these things are all over the place. You know, there's people. So these distros will buy, you know, cases like cases and cases and cases of legal edibles and waste them and ship them to New York, <laughs> you know, I mean, so on, on top of everything else, like that shit is going on, like out of control. And you would think that that would be real easy for the regulators to catch. And, and I, I would have to believe it is if they wanted to, you know, if they really wanted to, they got to be able to put like some kind of red flag systems into metric. But I heard a story where a store that's in the middle of nowhere with a very low population. I believe it was like weed, California, something like that, which is a cool place, but very low population. Um, or, or something like that. Just this, you know, tiny town, they had a dispensary and they had a million, um, filled cartridges <laughs> drop there in, in their metric. It's like, uh, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> you know, it was like in the middle of nowhere. And so, and, and they disappeared. That's the other thing. <laughs> they all got like one reason or another. They all just kind of disappeared, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like there's so many holes right now that, for somebody like myself and the people that I work with, I work with an amazing team of people that are super passionate about their 
jobs and we get to help small farmers in our jobs every day, which is amazing. You know, we pay them double going rates uh, for their flour and it's an amazing team, like I said. And um, to just, and, and we're just so anal and compliant and just do everything. Like we pride ourselves on that, you know? And then I, we see all this stuff going on around us and it, it just makes you wonder, like, why are we doing this? You know, and I know it sounds crazy and sorry if I went off on a tangent about hemp, hemp but you know, like I said, most of the reason why I talk about hemp is truly not to push anybody necessarily into the hemp business. Although I don't know why, given what's going on, you wouldn't sell it under that guise versus risk your freedom. Um, but the reality is it's hurting. It's hurting the medical business. You know, medical cannabis basically turned into, oh, I'll just buy some hemp on Amazon when you should be a lot more thoughtful than that when you're picking out what medicine to use for critically ill patients or your grandma or whatever. Um, and, it, and just having a free for all where some people right are regulated and some people aren't to me is just really not fair, you know, like talk about unfair, like, holy shit. So, that's really why I talk about it so much is it's very, very aggravating. I've been aggravated about the hemp market since it started, even though I am glad that it created the awareness that cannabis can be useful medicinally and that it's not, you know, it, it helps destigmatize. It definitely does. Um, but it's not perfect. And it's got a long ways to go. <laughs> and, and the fact that it's, it's, you know, when you invest all of your marbles into something and then all of a sudden they're like, but you can just do this, you know, without any of this stuff. Um, and then it takes a huge chunk of your business to the point where, you know, there was, there was hardly enough business as it was. And now there's none, you know, oh, well. I chose, you know, I'm a big boy. I chose the market that I'm in. I chose the business that I'm in, but it is frustrating. You know, like I said, when you're trying to do the right thing and, you know, there is no clarity going on whatsoever. Yeah, I think it's madness. Me personally, I see us in a golden era of cannabis right now. I mean, like... To me, it's never been more exciting. <laughs> well, you are because you're in the heyday of medical in your state. But as soon as that goes away, the fucking party's over, my friend. Just in all aspects. I wouldn't say that and not just me personalized. I'd say all over the board. The way genetics are coming full <laughs> circle, like the underground. There's The cannabis culture has become so above ground. The underground is still part of it. Like any culture that goes pop, let's say that. I think it's a golden era of like underground legal or not, you know, like, I don't know. I, I'm just, I, I'm enjoying every moment of it. I think it's great right now. I think there's so many interesting things happening. Like, I can't believe there's could be shops in Houston already. Like this is blowing my mind. Like, it's just, shops, not cannabis. Either way. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, to me, we're at that point, goes. like in between a sleep and a wake where it's just foggy. And it's like lots of cool shit can happen then. Like I love, I love the now for cannabis. It, I don't love all the parts of it, of course. But like, man, this is fucking cool. Dude, my regulator uh, woman, that's my inspector for manufacturing. Awesome, you know, she's a, a scientist, a biologist, a food scientist. Like, really awesome. Older woman, you know, and she's like. These people honestly don't realize that THCA is the same thing as Delta nine after it's heated. Like they're like, she's like, you know, talking about sort of the uppers that actually create these things and enforce, you know, and she, you know, she even told me that it's, it's been brought up and talked to by people like herself that are a scientist versus the bureaucrats. 
and basically what she said is they were kind of like do 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 you know like they don't even want to know about it literally she's like don't you realize that this is going on and we're trying to write you know essentially we shouldn't even have our regulatory system given what's going on here it's worthless <laughs> but they don't want to hear about it they don't want to know about it and they won't even really address it at any of their big meetings you know in terms of the the actual state regulators in the state of california anyone got any <laughs> interesting questions in the chat here's your chance harry just took a big dab he's vulnerable to sway his direction of thought does anyone have anything groovy that i am very vulnerable because i just did a dab so anything could happen that's what i'm saying before he gets the next one in him <laughs> anyone got anything fucking cool to ask i'm pretty burnt i just smoked that afghani headband my mind just turned off the coffee i'm coming down off the brew <coughs> Um, it's, been really, it's been very cool to um, do a bunch of propagating, um, you know, from all different stages of growth, whether it's, you know, taking really hurting moms and, and regenerating or, you know, now newer clones or popping seeds, you know, getting more and more experience under the sun on demand. It's been really cool because you know i've 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 known these folks for over eight years now going on nine years and seen different generations of the sun on demand but this latest one is their high powered you know production model etc and um you know just like you know i'm i don't know i don't know how many months in now i am but it, it is a process, like I was telling you, of um, grooming your plants, you know, getting the plants to switch everything back on again. Because no matter what your other environment was indoors, you're going to be switching off a bunch of things in the plant because there's no actual sunlight, right? So certain things are going to shut down. If you don't have a great living soil, like my living soil beds outside, versus pots of bag dirt inside you know my bag dirt is good but it's not as good as my beds outside um so it's it's just been a great learning process again you know kind of realize it's funny because i realized this before is you really have to kind of do a general in my opinion the second generation past the first one that you introduced to putting under the sun on demand it's the same thing in, and there's really not many people in the world that can do this, where you can actually have a mom room slash propagation room in a greenhouse, let's say outdoors all year round without artificial lighting. So it, it is very different to do this. And, you know, you got to wrap your head around the difference. It is the sun and you know, you don't get all the 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 various um, layers in the atmosphere, you know, filtering this or that out at different times, and you don't get sun up and sun down. It's just on or off, you know. So there are there are some differences between indoors and outdoors when it comes to the sun. But besides the fact that there, you know, nothing can actually completely replicate the sun. This is just really close. It is fantastic, but like I said, you have to give it the chance. You have to be patient and get to these, you know, you have to start somewhere and you'll see good results, but at every generation that actually fully grows under there, you're going to start to see um, better and better results and um, healthier and healthier plants, actually, you know, uh, more natural expressions and growth patterns. You know, there's a lot of times where plants just grow too squat and too, you know, weird, basically under artificial light, whereas, or even just too, too lanky under artificial light, whereas under the sun on demand, you'll definitely get 
that natural expression. It's interesting. The seed plants really love it. Um, the ones that I actually started under the sun on demand took off way faster than the ones that I started under um, LED tubes and then moved over as soon as they popped out. No question, you know, like a month faster in terms of the growth and way thicker uh, uh, stem and a nice root ball on a one by one cube, which is pretty rare for a cannabis plant. So it was cool. Everything's been cool so far. And once I get all my beds planted up with these starts that I've started over the winter, then I'm going to do the flowering in there under, uh, under that fixture. And we'll take that for a rip because there'll be nothing in there. Yeah, everything will be outside. Hell yeah. We got a couple great questions in here, Harry. Uh-oh. The first one was from homie. He obviously does not know who he's messing with right now. I, I would invite you to hop on live real quick and see if you could take down a gram dab at 650 like my homie right here. So was that a hemp dab you were smoking? What genetics are you smoking there, Harry? Was that a hemp dab? <laughs> he obviously does not know who he is playing with. <laughs> that was a hemp THCA dab, of course. <laughs> but one of the questions, there was a couple good ones. One of them I feel is definitely worth touching on. I feel, yeah, this is beautiful. Which way do you think the market will land? Refining the hemp laws to kill the loophole? I honestly can't tell you, you know, like I said, it's, I'm really frustrated with it. You know, that's why I'm talking about it. Like, not that I'm like super serious, like let's start a hemp business. Like I'm really just want, I, I don't know. I just want to be able to take care of patients the way I used to. And, you know, ever since quote unquote legalization, the access has been harder and harder. That's all I know. You know, that's, that's the God's honest truth. But which way is it going to land? I mean, again, I, I couldn't possibly guess, you know, the way things are, it's it just on one hand, it's so hard to believe that a politician or a group of politicians that are powerful enough to shut this down is going to want to put their name on it right now to shut off anybody's income that actually could potentially lobby against them, you know? I I just maybe I'm wrong, but it's hard to believe that anything like that is going to happen right now. <clears throat> There's another one back up a little bit. You know, so I I really don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that anything's going to get disturbed there, even if they do decide something from the farm bill. It seems to me like they may make it even more lenient or leave it basically the same, just reinforce what's already going on. I just don't know. I, I really don't know. And I hope that the politicians deschedule and not reschedule. That's what we really want. And frankly, regardless of the implications of what happens to me with my world, um, I, I truly believe that that would be the best overall is if they just completely deschedule it <clears throat> and let it develop as a business. Um, you know, there is going to inevitably be some, some kind of intoxication laws going on somehow. <laughs> you know, just like alcohol, I would imagine, because of edibles. But um, but nonetheless, deschedule regardless of what the repercussions are. And let's see what happens, you know. How about this one, Admiral? I thought this was pretty good. What do terpenes have to play in the other cannabinoids from those converted to THC forms? So I don't think they test for anything like that. I don't think terpenes, like I can't quite get a clear question out of there, but it just makes my mind start going places. Like how to, how can terps fit into these, any, any part of this conversation? I don't think it really does. I don't think it, it's tested at all, but well, you mean in terms of THCA? And and by the way, I mean you're talking about labs, right? That 
have been overinflating test results for since the beginning of mandatory testing okay in 2018 in california at the, and and other places sooner and so i you know the fact that they found a lab or two or six that they can pay enough to keep everything below 0.3 percent delta 9 thc really is no surprise to me let's put it that way you know like i you know i i the labs that i test with um i have a close relationship with and they know that i want just straight ahead god's honest test results because i'm trying to get milligrams to do formulations for medical products but there are other people that that's not how they look at it and they do lab shopping and they definitely do potency shopping um there's plenty of people that when they pull their crop down that they test with a few different people and they see what the test results are and then when they come back the highest one is who they go with and then you can give them your <clears throat> test result and say this is what you gave me you know so this is what i expect essentially and um that's kind of how it rolls in a lot of cases and it's sad because that's led to the industry being slanted towards high potency weed theoretically but not in actuality and it doesn't really work that way anyway as a lot of people know already so you know it does in other words it doesn't surprise me that they can get test results that don't show converted cannabinoids that, that are you know show the delta 9 below 0.3 percent you know and that's that's why there's actually labs included in some of these lawsuits you know and we'll see what happens we will see what happens you know it's going to tell a lot like these there's a couple of doozy lawsuits one is in georgia against you know there's like 120 companies or something and tons of individuals we will see you know what happens during that case um that will be very telling for the rest of unless they actually get add some clarity to the farm bill coming up here like uh one of our one of our viewers is saying here i mean it could easily happen where at any moment they give us clarity on the farm bill and it shuts a lot of doors off of course that could happen it would just be it would be unbelievable there it would piss off a lot of people that are making a lot of money and <clears throat> i just don't think there's anybody eager to do that and in, in government right now so we'll see we will see i mean i'm i'm just here like the rest of you guys and gals but um yeah i mean that's right now it is a free-for-all and that's all i do know <laughs> i do know that and um it's uh it's it's very annoying you know there's people that took over a big player's factory diagonally across from me you know in eureka that they're just pumping out they have this machine that puts out like three million gummies a day or some shit it's crazy so here's a good one harry this is a total abrupt change of the sails all right i like it from eastern to western winds let me get back to it here we go Grow in Love asks, Harry, how would you describe the spiritual effects that cannabis has on the user? And I would add on to that the positive medicinal effects it may have to someone with serious mm -hmm. ailments. Spiritual effects? Um, I mean, yeah, it depends on what you consider spiritual, first of all. But uh, I definitely think it opens you up to being spiritual that's for sure and uh to me being spiritual about cannabis has to do with you know considering <laughs> that mother nature is essentially our fearless leader um however uh you know from a medicinal standpoint there's no question that um it, it was it, it's kind of wild but it was a later on discovery that in human beings there or a lot of mammals have endocannabinoid systems 
and that these phytocannabinoids, the plant cannabinoids, um, interact with our endocannabinoid system in a lot of ways that can be very uh, vital and important to people like myself with various autoimmune challenges and um, a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. So, you know, <laughs> to j just to be able to, to feel, you know, um, a lot of different health benefits that it gives is quite spiritual unto itself. Uh, people, you know, that are super anxious with serious social anxiety, being able to quiet that down and function uh, because they found the right cannabinoid therapy combination for themselves or, um, you know, of course, <clears throat> one of the big things that got me knee deep in the medical cannabis industry is the kids that had neurological challenges and serious seizure issues and being able to, uh, help with some of that, you know, um, a lot of that is pretty spiritual you know, being able to create medicine and help people and uh, just knowing that this plant is so symbiotic with mammals in general, but, you know, human beings is all I could speak for that uh, from personal experience, it's extremely medicinal, extremely useful for many, many things. Obviously, we've talked about this, you know, from autoimmune dysfunctions, the cancer, to seizures, to social anxiety, to premenstrual, you know, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different ailments, both topically and orally. And I am of the mindset as well that pretty much all use is medicinal, whether people realize it or not, you know, people are very drawn to it. And uh, the people that are drawn to it and continue to use it, obviously, it's more spiritual and useful for them. There are people that do outgrow it or grow out of it, I should say, <clears throat> where it doesn't really jive with them that well for whatever reason. Uh, so, you know, definitely has some close contact with living things as well. There's sort of a force feedback there. I'd chime in for myself as well. If, uh, if growing cannabis counts as much as consuming it, it, it saved my life. Like it, it saved me. Isn't that the pitch that a lot of the spiritual, you know, narrative is like, I would go that far, maybe not from a serious health problem from consuming it, but from my life, my lifestyle, what it was and what, you know, I'm still here. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's beyond spiritual for me. A plant saved me, you know, like big time. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the thing. Like when I got extremely sick and was essentially on my deathbed, I, you know, the fact that cannabis is what ended up really helping the big turnaround. I had a lot of help and took other supplementation, you know, consistency was very important. But having the right cannabinoid combination, you know, this all this stuff was very new back then. So nobody really knew, you know, exactly what to do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I had a lot of different experts in a lot of different fields to help guide me towards, a new, you know, essentially the three to one that saved my life. The sour tsunami is really what knocked it out of the ballpark versus a one to one or a 20 to one. It was really the three to one plus the acidic form of the three to one. I took both together. The um, original sour tsunami <laughs> seed plant. And um, that's, you know, that's what turned everything around in a very short order. And it was kind of spooky because I had been taking other style of cannabis oil. That was, it was a full spectrum THC made from chem dog, but you know, the real deal, but it did not do what, you know, this just all of a sudden turned everything around and shut down the autoimmune response within about um, 60 days you know, from starting that to finish all of a sudden I woke up and I didn't even remember that I was sick, which was unbelievable because 
to that point, you know, I definitely knew I was sick. I was really hurting. So, you know, it, it was, it was a revelation and it's really what started Ringo and myself just, you know, going sick. Like neither one of us could believe it. Um, I was really hurting. And then all of a sudden it just turned around. And um, then we started really honing in on certain genetics and I perfected the extractions and he kept honing in more and more on certain genetics that we were looking for the high beta caryophylline, the high cannabinoid content, the 20 to one, the three to one, the one to one, um, you know, a few different variables in there, but uh, he pretty much hit a home run with the Harley Sue, Kana Sue, Sour Tsunami, Swiss Sue. And then, you know, of course, he stabilized and amplified the um, ACDC that Courtney brought back from Europe. He took that and stabilized, you know, something that was a high beta caryophylline and was basically an exact 20 to 1. And same thing with the high limonene, which was a great one, too, that I wish I could uh, get my hands on again. I haven't seen that one around. I've seen others that are high in myrcene, which is okay, but it's not really what you're looking for. I'm looking for the high beta, and I got it. I got everything I need back, thank goodness. I popped a ton of ACDC times Harley Sue, which is what we called, you know, the 2012 for a while, at least what I called the 2012 for a while. Um, that was basically the last version of the good 20 to 1 that uh, Ringo was playing with before he took off to another world and uh you know it's been the best most reliable there's there's a couple different versions of it that i'm selecting through now but um super stoked to have new moms of that as well new moms of the garlic rose new moms of the acdc harley sue new moms of a bunch of different fun varieties That's cool. You have a pretty good population of the uh, the 2012s. I think you're running through to look through now. Yeah, I I did pop a good amount. I decided to because you really don't know. You know, these are not new seeds. First of all, and second of all, I I really did want to get the best female examples, and then I will do test results, and I will definitely catch some pollen. I'm hoping to get some test results from the males to do that, but I may just catch some pollen depending on what happens. You know, I don't have, don't have any help, so I'll do the best that I can, but I'm definitely going to catch some pollen so that I can re up some seeds for sure. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Rest in peace, Ring Lawrence Ringo, for sure. He definitely helped save my life, that's for sure. It was definitely a team effort to, you know, put everything together that first time, essentially. And um, moving forward, you know, Ringo was unstoppable. He was rapid firing, just constantly doing breeding projects dozens of them at a time and all these little tents all over his property most of them were just under the sun so he would just grow as long as he possibly could and tents all over the place like you know costco garage tents with uh greenhouse covers on them with just packed with one gallon pots and just rapid firing through them covering them you know doing uh lots and lots and lots of tests tissue tests it's one thing the lab that he used to work with <clears throat> used to do a lot of tissue testing and was able to do a lot of great predictions for him so he was able to rapid fire through a lot of samples it costs a lot of money but he was able to rapid fire through thousands of plants and really kind of know what was going to be higher percentages overall and what the ratios were going to be before he got too far down the road so he did a lot of generations in a very short amount of time 
which is how he ended up stabilizing a lot of these original genetics at a certain ratio. That was something that nobody really had at that time. There were people that potentially could have gotten some CBD in there a little bit, one or two percent, or people that may have been able to get a one to one, but to get a 20 to one was unheard of. <clears throat> so, anyway, the reality is um, grow diversity. <laughs> <laughs> Grow diversity. But, you know, Lawrence was ahead of his time and he didn't even realize it at the time. And it did kick off the whole CBD revolution with all the hemp stuff that we're seeing going on right now, which is also what is so ironic. And all of that really just sort of clouds and pollutes the, the actual medicinal side of things. And it's too bad, but some of us are still out there here trying you know and uh we will hold the line we will hold the line yeah that's the thing about ai you know that i always think about is it learns from us so how can it ever get smarter than us from learning from us uh, it's, it seems like an impossibility that it's, it's restricted to a certain level of intelligence, but, um, obviously I, I would there's say people that don't think that I would say it's more impact than that. Like, I don't think most sane humans claim to be more intelligent than mother nature. But what impact do we have on her, even if she is more intelligent, if that's the metric? Like, you know, I think that's the way to look at it. Like, so what if it isn't better? What's the impact? <laughs> you know, do you think that Mother Nature was thinking of our impact when it spewed us up? Like, I don't think so. Like, Got it. Yeah, know? I've been hearing about the white there. Uh, but <clears throat> it's funny, the white that I know of, <clears throat> excuse me. Is a high THC plant, high THCA plant, high THC plant. But I have heard of now this plant from Oregon that somebody told me about is from Oregon called the white that's a high CBGA plant. And you can get something that's really high, high CBGA. And we're doing a project right now where we're looking to get just the right CBGA uh, spectrum which is not going to be easy because it tends to lean in directions that I'm not looking for. I'm looking for a high beta caryophylline. So we'll see if I can get that. I will be happy. And I have some other stuff to formulate it with. We're going to be playing with THC VA, which is really fun from uh, Emerald spirit botanicals. Shout out to them. They do an amazing job and they got some really interesting minor cannabinoid strains um, like Pink Boost Goddess and uh, Four Directions and Royal Blueberry. The Royal Blueberry is some of the most incredible smelling flower that I have smelled all year. It's absolutely intoxicating. I mean, absolutely intoxicating. What's that about certified organic? I got he's itchy. Saying, he's saying certain uh, family tree of genetics, I'm thinking, is uh, is like, you know, ideal for the situation that we were talking about most early in the show. I think that's kind of a good game there. CBDV. Don't get I have certified organic. I need I need CBDVA. <clears throat> That's another type of strain that I'm obviously looking at always. Always looking for new genetics, whether it's CBDVA. CBDVA is much more useful, in my opinion, than THCVA. Um, THCV and THCVA essentially, you know, shuts off your endocannabinoid system in certain ways. And the more that you take, the more it does. So I don't know why you would challenge your endocannabinoid system rather than enhancing your endocannabinoid system. I have yet to 
understand that other than I have heard that having <clears throat> that mixed in uh, does help people with bone depletion problems as well as um, people that are uh, diabetic. So I'm, I'm always open, but I'm definitely puzzled because of how it works as to why people are, you know, a lot of people think that it, it, it um, curbs your appetite and it might if it was by itself, but all the THCVA strains that there is out there are almost one to one. Some are two to one with THCA. So, you know, that's going to give you hunger. Uh, and I, I don't know. I think you'd have to have a much higher THCVA to THCA ratio before that would become, you know, a thing where it would actually suppress your appetite because I have not experienced that. Um, and I've now experienced some of, as far as I know, some of the best THCVA material in California. Uh, I don't know about anywhere else, but in California, the Emerald Spirit Botanical stuff is pretty much it. <clears throat> CBD button stuck. <laughs> Just gives you anxiety. Yeah, I mean, people definitely have different thoughts about it, you know. Um, I haven't played with it too much, but I think that the acidic form of it is probably going to be the most useful form for me because I'm going to use it medicinally and I may, we'll see, I may make one by itself. I may make one where it's blended, you know, both activated and not activated and also like CBD and, and CBDA. Like put all of it in there because the reality is we, you definitely need something to balance it out because I just can't believe that. She, I mean, unless it's for a specific use, I just can't believe that, she, that, that, you know, doing anything that makes it more challenging for your cannabis, your endocannabinoid system to work properly would be a good thing medicinally. I think people like it because a lot of people, when they smoke it, um, not the isolate. See, you're talking about isolate. I'm talking about literally a one-to-one -one that's beautifully grown by, by a, an amazing family farm in Mendocino. You know, incredible, incredible material, beautiful. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's either a two-to-one or a one-to-one, -one, depending on which plant it is. And it's... Definitely not like super paranoia. Like a lot of people love it, but I, I don't get it. What creates the head high? With what? THCVA? With anything. I mean, there is THCA in this. That's what I'm saying. It's a one-to-one. -one. So the THC converts the Delta 9. The Delta 9, you know, goes right after your CB1 receptors and your CB1 receptors has the capability to create intoxication. <coughs> THC, definitely. Delta 9 <coughs> will get a hold of your receptors and cause intoxication. Excuse me. That's the easy way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I haven't experimented too much with THCVA. I tend, I, I kind of know what I like. I either like high CBDA, I like high CBD, I like high, you know, THC if I'm going to ingest it. But I don't, I'm not like a big, you know, let's, let's do a bunch of minor, let's smoke a bunch of minor cannabinoids. Like, I don't know, you know, I know a lot of people like it and it's cool um it's something to try once or twice but i'm not super you know enthralled by it or anything i would take it medicinally but that's about it any uh thoughts on the eclipse tomorrow and what it can mean for Cannabis plants, cannabinoid therapy, us as humans in general. 
How do we take this time, which seems rare and full of energy, and harness it into something groovy? <laughs> I don't know. Just don't stay. <laughs> I thought you were a magician, Harry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, I know what's going on, but I haven't really paid attention to it, and it remains to be seen whether I'm even going to be able to see or notice it. So. If it happens and it's cool, cool, you know, I mean, I, I, this isn't the first eclipse, I guess it's, you know, there's, there's, there must be a million kinds of eclipses or something because every one is like, oh, this hasn't happened in 500 years. And it's like, well, we kind of have had eclipses in my lifetime. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know. I don't even try to pretend to know. And that's okay. I like that. That's that's a cool answer. I mean, in terms of, you know, in terms of the cannabis industry, whatever, I think that, you know, you should enjoy it. Any astrological event that you can witness is worth it. And if you have any kind of means of using a telescope or, you know, having a great observation point where it's super dark and you get a great view, then it's well worth it. That's, you know, where I live, that's exactly what it's like. It's like going on a 60 mile hike into the wilderness and living there. There's no street lights for at least 60 miles in any direction. You can't see any anywhere. Um, and maybe more. So, and, 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 and at nighttime, after, basically in town, they shut all the lights off at 10 o'clock, basically. The big lights. Because there's an ordinance or something, so I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying, Admiral. What do you say? Should we cut it off? It looks like the chat's getting a little ass grabby out there. Maybe we should uh, we should cut it off before they excite themselves. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't we have know. bad people saying bad things. It devolves into chaos eventually. The title of this episode was Cannabinoid Therapy. If you don't know how to read, if you only know how to type or voice chat or something. <laughs> and a big ups to all the people. Big respect to everyone, you know, lending their insight or their perspective. A big fuck you to all the ass grabbers in the chat, spamming and wasting that time. Get your therapy up. <laughs> I can't see that. I guess I'm fortunate. Are you lucky? <laughs> yeah, I don't see any of that. You, so here's what would be my insight on that. You like get lost in textlation sometimes, I call it. Like a lot of times you'll be like, you'll have to clarify that. And it's like, you got to be able to interpret the, the textlation, I call it, translation. How fools be typing, you know, lots of ass grabbing. <laughs> I, am, uh, I am itching to death from, uh, we did a bunch of compost turning earlier. And now I am uh, like itching all over. I better take a hardcore shower. I'm like, <laughs> like just freaking out almost now. Uh, we turned a bunch of compost, bunch of creepy crawlies, good stuff. But yeah, I'm definitely getting itched out and freaked out. Like microbes. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to look, you know, I'm like, like my nose, my mouth, like everything is itching. I had, I made the mistake of flinging, you know, I ended up like covered in dirt at one point. So it's time. Hell yeah. Hi, Jim. Stoked to see the crew. I appreciate you as always, Harry. I mean, this, this series. Thanks is everybody for coming. Thanks for uh, hanging in there, shooting it up, talking about the crazy hemp industry and lots of other crazy topics. Of course, you know that um, some of this is tongue in cheek and some of it isn't. But uh, overall, it's it's uh, overall good fun. So, pretty good plans. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We will see you next week uh, for another episode, and we will talk about other fun topics for sure. Appreciate you, Admiral. Appreciate everyone. As far as uh, some house cleaning, as Don Peter calls it, if anyone's still tuning in to the end of this show, you're probably an addict, FCP, if you're watching all the way to the end. So here's what's coming up soon. Should be doing a podcast, a broadcast with Nick coming up this week. I think we're going to be talking about the electron transport chain 
and like EH, which uh, is going to cover like redox and oxidation. It's some heavy stuff. I've already listened to what he's talked about before about four times, and I think I'm finally comfortable to ask some more questions. He thinks it's a cool topic to bring up. Uh, the Sun on Demand trial grow is coming very soon. I couldn't be more excited to share that. And uh, that's all I could think of off the top of my head. Big love to Don Peters. Support DAGA. Hoping to get Jim's Beans Humboldt Legacy Seeds on DAGA soon. And, uh, yeah, big ups to Don Peters. Support DAGA. Appreciate y'all. Stay cool. Over and out.